Hello everyone, Team and Gaming, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you another one of my football talk videos. Now, today's video isn't really going to be as long as my other football talks because there's only one thing I really wanted to talk about, and that is the upcoming World Cup. And obviously, this is going to be very, very England centric, being an England fan and being an Englishman, so. Let's start with England, and England have played their last two friendly games before the World Cup since I made my last video, because in my last Football Talk video I talked a little bit about the Peru game, obviously they've gone on to play Ecuador and Honduras, and you know, the first game versus Honduras, 2-all, and then the second game last night versus, no sorry, the other way around, first game against Ecuador was 2-all, and then the game last night against Honduras was 0-0, nil -nil. and a lot of people have come out and said, oh, there were disappointing performances, you know, we need to improve, etc, etc, and you know, that is true, you know, obviously if we play like we did last night, you know, not scoring a goal against Honduras, if we play like that against Uruguay and Italy, then possibly we'll lose the game, but what people have got to remember is this is the last game before the World Cup. If you think a player is going to be playing 100% the last game before a World Cup, you are sadly mistaken because we've already seen across the nation so many people getting injured. You know, Montalivo breaks his leg, Royce out for the tournament, and England, obviously, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain on the end of a really unfortunate challenge against Ecuador. It's just one of those things. You know, the guy just sort of rolls over his knee and ankle, and, you know, it, Fortunately, it does sound today, Roy Hodgson has come out and said that he's almost certainly going to be fit for the tournament, which is fantastic news. But you know, this is evidence of just how easy it is to pick up an injury. And if you think players are going to be you know, leaving that leg in for anything near where they would in a proper competitive game, you're not going to see that because people don't want to get crocs before the World Cup. This has been four years of work for some of these players who have been part of this international setup for a long time. You know, this is the culmination of their efforts. They want to play in the World Cup, and there is no way they're going to go steamrolling into challenges and risk you know, that injury. Even an injury of three weeks, which is not a major injury in the grand scheme of things, that is your tournament over. It's just, it's not worth the risk. So, yes, I admit we could have played better against Honduras, but you know, we are still going out there with a lot of attacking players in the field and actually looking to do well. And this is the main thing for me. Because the expectation levels for England are relatively low, and I think that's a good thing, you know, because far too often in the past, gone into tournaments saying, Are we going to win the World Cup? We're going to win, we're going to win. And it's just not realistic, you know. We are probably, you know, eighth best team in the world, somewhere around there. You know, if you look at the great teams out there, the top four, the big four, probably Argentina, Brazil, Germany, and Spain, those are the four teams that everybody says are going to win the World Cup. You know, those are the four teams that most people are going to say are going to win the World Cup. And then beyond them, you've got a big group of teams like the Belgians, France, Italy, England, Portugal. All of those teams are quite evenly matched. So you could put us anywhere between, you know, like I said, probably 8th or a little bit higher, down to about 15th. You couldn't really complain because you know that's the thing. There's so many very, very evenly matched teams at the top of world football. You know, it's going to be very, very tight. So you can't really expect us to go out and win the thing. But then again, once you get through the group, you never know. You, know, you never know in a World Cup. And if we get to the quarterfinals, I think that will be a very, very successful World Cup considering we've you know, picked a lot of young players. We're in a difficult group. You know, and there's a lot of absolutely outstanding teams out there. And obviously playing in South America is never easy. But, you know... I, I think that the criticism in the press over the Honduras performance and the Ecuador performance has been a little bit over the top for the reasons I've mentioned. You know, players are not going to be giving their all because they don't want to get injured. And you know, these are difficult games. You know, Ecuador and Honduras are not easy teams. We don't exactly play them very often. Different styles. And they're no mugs. They're no pushovers. So, you know... I was pleased with the fact that we actually went out and tried to play attacking football. We played some really, really slick moves in both the games. You know, the move for the Daniel Sturridge chance last night against Honduras was just beautiful football. It really was, and Sturridge just shanks the ball wide. And then, obviously, the rainstorm came. If that goal had gone in, I could have seen England win that game 3-4-0 very, very comfortably. But, unfortunately, it didn't happen. And you're up against a Honduras team who made life incredibly difficult with their just quite simply ridiculous challenges. I mean, Emmanuel Ishigiri should have got sent off. For, he basically booted the ball into the balls of Daniel Sturridge from about three yards away. How is that not a red card? You know, that should have been a red card. Obviously, there was a red card late on for two buckable offences after a guy goes flying in with his arm and takes out Leighton Baines. Steven Gerrard was on the wrong end of an absolute crunching challenge. 
and you see all of these things happen as a player you think wow these guys are going in a bit too hard I'm not going to risk my leg risk my ankle risk my knee in a friendly against Honduras you know when players like Jack Wilshire came on and Ross Barkley I think it energised us a little bit more and you know it was one of those games where I think we were a little bit unlucky to win it was incredibly frustrating but you could understand why and at the end of the day, we've come through the warm-up games, we've acclimatised to the slightly warmer climate, we've got a lot of different players playing you know, for us now. The worst thing that could have happened is we played the same 12, 13 players every game. We've given a lot of people an opportunity to make them feel part of the touring party, we've got them included, we've you know, got them warmed up a little bit, and now we're going to move into the tournament, I think, in a, a pretty good position. When you consider the fact that Italy drew 1-1 to Luxembourg, I think our nil-nil draw with Honduras is looking a lot better considering how we actually played in the game. So, you know, it's very, very easy to blow these things out of all proportion, but overall, I'm relatively happy with our preparation. It's always good to go out there, get three games under the belt with no major injuries. You know, it's good news to hear that Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain is probably going to be fit and fire and ready for the tournament because he was one of our best players already, you know looked incredibly lively and every time he was on the pitch and he's really really pushing for a start you know very very difficult to call England's team and I've been having a bit of a think about England's team and who I would like to start in the first game against Italy and pretty much the back five picks itself I mean we saw the game against Ecuador when Roy Hodgson experimented with the back line and played players like Small in and played James Milner at right back and it didn't really work our back five is pretty much guaranteed for that first game with Joe Hart in goal, Johnson at right back, Cahill and Jagielka as the two centre backs, and then Leighton Baines at left back. And I think that back five is pretty solid. You know, you've got Leighton Baines had two phenomenal seasons with Everton, obviously linked with Manchester United last year. Very, very good. The best left back in the country at the moment, no doubt, and one of the best left backs in the world. You know, left back is our strong position, which is a bit of a shame. If we've had three world class centre forwards, we might actually do a little bit better. But having such depth at left back, Baines quality player, you know Gary Cahill has come on leaps and bounds since he, I can't believe we sold him at Aston Villa, it's one of the things that really annoys me, but I suppose at the time we had Martin Larson and Arlie from Melbourg as our two centre backs, so you can understand the decision, but he's just consistently got better and better every year, he is a very very good centre back, you know, John Terry and Gary Cahill were fantastic for Chelsea this season. He's got pace, he's good on the ball, he's good in the air, he pops up and scores the odd goal. Very, very good. And I think he fits Phil Jagielka very, very well because Jagielka's a little bit more of a, you know, old-fashioned style of defender. He's going to be, you know, he's on the Richard Dunn school of defending. When in doubt, whack it out, which is the way I used to defend as well when I used to play football. But... I think they're a good foil for each other. Gary Cahill has the pace to cover Jagielka, and when he gets a little bit you know, physical and rough, Jagielka will put himself about and put a few good challenges in. And then on right back, we've got Glenn Johnson. I'm not a massive fan of Glenn Johnson at right back. I always think he's pretty average at defending, but there's no doubt he's fantastic going forward. And you know, I always debate that I'd prefer to see Glenn Johnson play right mid because he's got all the attacking attributes. If you actually put someone behind him who is a solid defender, he'd do a very, very good job because he's got the defensive mentality. So he does track back and he is always in the right position, but he has mental aberrations. If you can remember back to the Euros when we played against Ukraine in, in the 3-2 win, both of the goals were his fault, and it wasn't because he wasn't doing the right thing. You know, He was in the right position, he was picking up the right man, but then he just switched off. You know, he switched off at the set piece for the header. It's just silly errors with Glenn Johnson. I think if he played him on that right wing, he cut them out, but... Yeah, we don't really have many other options. We've got basically picked Chris Smalling and Phil Jones as our backup right back. Milner doesn't work. We've got Kyle Walker injured. So he's our strongest right back and you know, he'll do a decent job for us. So that's the back five pretty much done. Moving into midfield, the first person who you're definitely going to see picked is obviously Steven Gerrard. England captain, one of the best players England have produced in a long, long time. You know, he's still a key part of this side. You know, fantastic on the ball. He's a natural leader. You know, you can see that when he plays for Liverpool. Whenever you see Steven Gerrard step onto the pitch at Liverpool, he just lifts everybody. He lifts the fans. He lifts the players. He lifts just the entire place. And he does exactly the same thing for England. You know, he's an inspirational player, and he, he's rightly England captain at the moment. Alongside him. I would actually like to see Jack Wilshire. You know, Jordan Henderson has had a fantastic season and you know, if he starts I wouldn't be disappointed. But I just felt when Jack Wilshire came on 
against Honduras, he added something a little bit different. And he's got great energy. He's just he's a very, very good player, and I would like to see him play. It's a good thing with Jack Wilshire as well. He's got the fire in the belly, you know. He always wants to put a shift in. There's a, a thing that members of the press and certain members of the public say that people don't care about playing for England anymore. I don't think that's true with Jack Wilshire. You can clearly see he wants to do well for England and if you look back at some of his friendly performances, you know, when he played against Brazil and Germany in these friendlies, he really does step up. So I think he's a bit of a big game player as well. So having Gerard and Wilshire in that midfield would really, really suit. And those are the two midfielders I definitely go for. Moving up the pitch, talking about the wingers. If Oxlade Chamberlain is 100% fit, I would like to see him start, but I don't think he will be. So ideally, I'd like to see Lalana and Raheem Sterling start. Although personally, I think. Roy Hodgson will start Danny Welbeck because Danny Welbeck is just one of those guys he's dependable you know exactly what you're going to get with him you know when you have a look at a player like Raheem Sterling or Adam Lallana they've both had tremendous seasons they're both fantastic players but they are unproven at the highest level and there's always that question with Raheem Sterling you saw it with his red card a little bit of a reckless challenge unnecessary and that's the thing can you at the very, very highest level, trust Raheem Sterling for 90 minutes. I'm not sure at the moment. Having him on the bench, he's so versatile. You know, He can play wide. He played in that number 10 role behind the striker a lot for Liverpool this season and did very, very well. I would like to see him come on as a real impact sub. And we saw that in the first game against Peru. He came on as a substitute, had a huge impact on the game, really looked lively. So that's who I'd like to start. Obviously, it doesn't look like the Ox will be fit. So having you know, Lalana and it's got to be Danny Welbeck probably, that that's a decent pairing. So I, I'm relatively happy with that. The big question now is, do you start Ross Barkley? Because Ross Barkley's had a very, very good impact in the friendlies. He's had a great season. He's one of our best attacking players. You know, when he gets the ball, he always wants to go forward and he's not afraid to try something. And you know, Alan Smith said something which I, I completely agree with when he did an interview for Sky Sports News this week. He said it seems like Ross Barkley wears the England shirt very, very lightly and I completely agree with that. You know, you see some players when they make that step up, they don't do the things that we were doing for the club and you know the, the reason why they got selected because all of a sudden it's like, oh I'm actually playing for England here. This is this is super serious and that they tense up and they don't do what they normally do. I don't think you can say that about Russ Barkley. He always wants to run with the ball. He's always very direct. He always takes players on. You know, the assist for Lambert's goal in the second game when he just drove at like four or five players, he just sucked in so many players and made like five or six yards of space for Lambert, who then took the, the goal fantastically well. But that's exactly what Barkley gives you, just that drive, that skill. And he's a big lad as well. You know, don't think don't forget that. You know, Russ Barkley's not a small guy he has all of this technical ability and he is a bit of a beast so that's very very useful the problem is if you start Ross Barkley what do you do with Wayne Rooney because Wayne Rooney for all the criticism he receives is still our best international player I think on his day Wayne Rooney is a phenomenal player and admittedly he hasn't done it at the highest level for England very very often unfortunately but he's still our best player if you're going to start Ross Barkley, in my opinion, you have to start him in that central attacking midfield role, that number 10 position. That's where he's best at, that's where he's played for Everton most of the season. I don't think you can have him in a central midfield role with more responsibility because his natural instinct is to go forward. And if you look at how he played with Everton this season, you always had Gareth Barry behind him, that very, very responsible player who's just going to sit and just going to patrol. And just and we do have that with England with Gerrard, but we've already got so many attacking players. And if, like I want, we're going to start Sterling and Lalana, that they're so attacking. They're incredibly attacking players. If we put Barkley in there as well, that's a lot of attacking players in one area of the pitch. So I'm personally hoping Rooney starts, although it's... It's very, very difficult because, like I said, Barkley's a phenomenal player and he's done really, really well this season and in the warm-up games. But if we do start him, that means Rooney's going to have to play on the left. And Wayne Rooney on the left-hand side doesn't work. You know, he's got great work rate. He's very, very skillful and good on the ball. He's got a good pass on him. But he's he's a centre-forward. You know, he plays number 10 or he plays up front or you don't play him. You know... 
that was one of the big mistakes David Moyes made this season at Manchester United. He had all of these talented players and he played as many of them out of position as possible. He played Fellaini wide, he played Rooney wide, he played Mata wide. You can't do that. You have to play your best players in their best position to get the best out of them. So that means Wayne Rooney's going to have to start at number 10 or up front. And if you start him up front, you have to drop Daniel Sturridge. And you're not going to drop Daniel Sturridge because he's been fantastic this season. So that means Sturridge has to play up front. Rooney has to play number 10 and unfortunately Ross Barkley has to sit on the sidelines which is just the sad thing but again like I mentioned with Raheem Sterling you know if Roy Hodgson goes that way and I think what he'll go is he'll go Henderson, Gerrard, Welbeck, Rooney and Lana as the the five in behind um, Sturridge up front. If that happens, it means you've got another fantastic attacking impact substitute to make, who late on in the game against some tired Italians in very, very hot Manaus, he can come on, he can run at them, be very, very direct, and create chances and score goals. So, it's one of those. We're actually going into a tournament with a lot of players who have had good seasons and who are in good form and who are actually pushing themselves forward for selection this is a great thing to have because Roy Hodgson could name six or seven different team permutations and people would say yeah yeah I can understand why he's picked that you might not agree but you can understand his decision making and you know, this is the thing that you know, Roy Hodgson's had a lot of very very unfair criticism at times as England manager but I think he's done a very very good job because he's come in to a job which is notoriously difficult and notoriously unforgiving He's come into a job where most of the players who have, you know, were known as our golden generation, the Ferdinands, the Terrys, the Gerrards, the Lampards, all of these players are aging. Ashley Cole, another great example. He's brought in a new raft of young players where everybody said the Premier League doesn't have enough young players. He's managed to develop and find and push forward enough good young players to actually give us a chance. And he's now playing in a style where we're actually looking to create chances and score goals ahead of just get through a game, you know. Because it always seemed in the past that England's first consideration was to not lose instead of to win. And you're ne never going to go very far in football with that as your mindset. So, overall, I'm very, very happy with where England are in international football. And, you know, <laughs> saying this now, we're probably going to crash out in the group and Costa Rica will beat us 8-0 and it'll all be very, very disappointing and... But yeah, that's football. You never can really tell what's going to happen. But I have to say, overall, considering where we've been in previous tournaments where we've had players complaining of boredom, which for me is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. If you're an international footballer going to represent your country in a tournament away from home and you say you're bored, you should never play for your country again. Because if you cannot motivate yourself in that situation, there is something wrong with you. So that boredom argument, in my opinion, is just complete balls. But that's what we've had to deal with before. We've had to deal with this gross over-exaggeration of our potential, with this unbelievable pressure from the press, and these ridiculous stories coming out of the camp of players being bored. You know, all of this we haven't had to deal with. Roy Hodgson is just a very, very sensible, composed manager who just gets on with the job, knows exactly what he wants to do, and has actually prepared a squad of players now who I have faith in. Faith not to win the tournament. I don't think that's going to happen. If it happens, I'll be ecstatic and I'll probably do cartwheels down the main street. But it's probably not going to happen. But I actually have faith in England this time that we are going to go to a World Cup and give a good account of ourselves in difficult conditions, in a difficult group, in a difficult place in the world to play football. And I'm actually going in with a fair degree of optimism. So fingers crossed we can actually go in and support our team and will them on to victory instead of the negativity and all of that which always surrounds England football. And, you know, in this series I've spent a huge amount of time criticising the FA and criticising the Premier League and saying we need more of this and we need less of that. And that's definitely valid. But this is the time where we've got to go up and support the national team and say, go on boys, give it your best shot. And I'm actually hopeful that for once we're in a position to do that so guys thank you so so much for listening to the video i really hope you've enjoyed it and as always have a great day and bring on the world cup